people from around the world, I suppose, who are professional X-ray operators, you know, just for this event, you know, how hard can that be, you know? But I, well, I, I do think the police need to take a bigger role uh, in what they're doing, because as far as they keep saying to us, they, they keep mentioning the police, but saying, oh, well, the police might, will be happy to help you, because they'll be bored most of the time, they won't be doing anything. Well, I mean, I've spoken to journalists who were briefed by the police, freelance journalists in London, and the police are saying, well, we've we really got nothing to do with this uh, event. Uh, uh, we are not uh, in any way uh, saying who goes in and who goes out at all. That's right, and they should be. And, and you know what? When um, uh, I was asking, I asked very subtle questions, and, and you know, so it didn't seem like I'm a journalist sticking my hand up. <laughs> you know, but when I, you know, I, I was asking basically, how are they going to to, to, to be identifying, you know, potential, you know, uh, terrorists or you know, undesirables coming in? And he says, don't worry about that. You know, let JTAC handle all that kind of stuff, and that's the the Joint Terrorist Analysis Centre. Well, they don't really do anything. All they do is collate information and then pass it on to the relevant agencies. You know, so really. What, what, what we're hoping for, really, is for a terrorist to come with a big sign that says, I am a terrorist, and, uh, <laughs> and for the security services to, to, to step in. Uh, unfortunately, in my experience and experience of the world, that doesn't tend to happen. So I think the police need to actually, you know, stand up to G4S. This is the police of this country, you know. Um, uh, they are good at what they do. They are hard-working people. You know, we pay them a lot of money to do this. Um, I would like to see them at the Olympics doing their job. OK, well, Lee Hazeldean, thanks ever so much for that fascinatingly detailed exclusive report. Uh, and we hope to be speaking to you, if you manage to remain undercover, in future weeks. OK, Tony, thanks ever so much. Cheers. Now I'm joined uh, by Martin Summers in the studio. Martin, the implications here are pretty horrific, aren't they? The idea that a private company is running this and also they are looking at it simply as a money-making exercise. What, what Lee's alleging there is that they're cutting a lot of corners and that ultimately that, uh, that the games are wide open. Well, I think that's true, but I think also the point he made about the police not being in charge is extremely worrying. We know for a, for a fact from previous history that terrorist attacks on big events like this and big targets like the World Trade Center are not always carried out by people coming from outside. So for example, I'll give you an example, the, uh, the underpants bomber so-called who uh, was arrested over uh, Detroit uh, supposedly setting off a bomb in his underpants a couple of Christmases ago. We know for a fact because uh, Laurie Haskell and Kurt Haskell who are lawyers who are on the plane have given the information to the international media, it's been ignored here, that he was taken onto the plane without going through security at all uh, by a, a well-dressed Indian gentleman and in fact he didn't have a passport or a ticket. Now in other words, and that was at Schiphol Airport in, uh, in Amsterdam. Now the security at Schiphol Airport is not run by the Dutch authorities, it's been privatised as we've just been discussing. It's actually run by an Israeli security company called ICTS uh, who've actually been banned from various Scandinavian airports. Privatisation of security is an open invitation to terrorist attack and we're not talking about people in caves in Afghanistan. The looks like the underpants bomber was actually a set up job by somebody's intelligence services we're, we're not quite sure who. So what evidence do you have for that? We've got Kurt, Kurt Haskell go to his blog and you will see he gave evidence at the trial of the guy which was which was disallowed although he did give a statement to the court he said I was on that plane and that he's not the only one he saw the underpants bomber being taken onto the plane without going through any detectors at all and that he didn't have a, pa a, 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 a passport or a ticket. Now in other words the real problem with terrorist attacks, and we could include 7 7 and 9 11 in this, is that they're not in fact carried out by random people trying to break through a security ring. They're done by people inside the security ring, often connected to intelligence agencies. And this is why you shouldn't privatise security. Now, this is, you because mentioned. You're opening the, the door what, to these kind of things happening. Well, you mentioned the 7 7 London bombings there. Indeed. One one thing that very few people know is Indeed. that the. Uh, CCTV surveillance system which is actually quite sophisticated across the London underground was privatised uh, just about six months before the London bombings uh, and privatised to an Israeli firm Verint Systems. Now Verint as it is actually a small company of a parent company and the boss of that parent company Kobe Alexander is on the 
run um, from the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, uh, having absconded with $13 million of Converse Technologies money, uh, last heard of out in Namibia in hiding and uh, facing extradition back to the United States. So obviously it's a, it's a, a crooked uh, parent company, but Daniel Bodner, who's the chief uh, executive of uh, Verint Systems, who are the private security firm for the London Underground, and still are, I believe, um, he's a former Israeli um, explosives officer in the Corps of Engineers in Israel. Indeed. So we talk about oh, we, who are the experts to protect us from the terrorists. So it'll be the experts on anti-terrorism. That'll be the Israelis, and they win these kind of contracts. But it's not just the Israelis. We know that there were uh, that there were exercises running on the day of seven seven because Peter Power told uh, the, the TV audience uh, that they were planning uh, exercises on bombs going off in exactly the tube stations where they did go off. Which is why when Lee was talking there, I presume that's not his real name, about them talking about there will, there will be some kind of event at the Olympics and we've provided all these body bags, you don't need to know any more. The worry has to be that the uh, terrorists inside the Western intelligence services, including the Israeli intelligence services, are planning a terrorist attack on the Olympics. And of course, it's far easier to carry out a terrorist attack if you're on the inside. And if we go back to the Munich Olympics and the attack on the Israeli team there, that was carried out by the Abu Nidal faction of the PLO or PFLP. Now, Abu Nidal was widely suspected all over the Middle East of actually working for the Israelis. So in other words, what the Israelis did there, possibly, is attack their own team in order to garner sympathy and so on and so forth. Fascinatingly enough, we've had a news story this week uh, in The Independent and in various other uh, newspapers, neo-Nazis helped carry out the Munich Olympics massacre. Yes, working with the Abu Nidal group, but the Abu Nidal group, he was based in he was based in Baghdad eventually, but he's widely believed across the Middle East by serious journalists to have been working, um, like Robert Fisk in, in, in Beirut, for example, to have been a, an Israeli agent all along. Now, I'm not saying that the, there is a plan by the Israelis or anybody else to attack the Olympics, but if, you are count, if, if your task is counter-terrorism at the Olympics, don't just think of people coming from games in Afghanistan. Think about who are the private companies that are being employed. Employed. Who are their leaders? I mean, uh, Blackwater and so on, they've been engaged in terrorist activity. Now, the fact is that these private companies are an open invitation to terrorism by uh, well-connected uh, intelligence uh, operatives. Reports by Iraqi, this is mo moving up to the present, this is two days ago, um, the, uh, a news agency called FNA, reports by Iraqi media have revealed that Israeli Secret Service Mossad is very active in Iraq and spying on Iran and its allies under the cover of Jordanian companies, according to a report by Iraqi Nakhel, that's N-A-K-H-E-L news agency. Iraqi resistance groups in separate statements have released the information and details of such undercover places and entities in different regions of Iraq, including Taji, Kirkuk and Baghdad, and announced that they have targeted these Israeli sites. Yes, and also it says in here that, they were, that they've been involved. I mean, obviously you do expect Mossad to be operating in Iraq as an intelligence agency. Most intelligence agencies are. That's in a way legitimate. But it suggests here that they've been involved in assassinating over 550 scientists and academic figures. So it's in Israel's interest to destroy Iraq's... Um, uh, industrial and military capacities that have been involved in assassinating scientists. Now, in other words, a lot of the mayhem out there, and we've been talking about Syria uh, in the previous weeks, a lot of the mayhem in Syria is clearly being orchestrated by Western intelligence agencies. agencies. The Saudis, the Qataris, the French, the British, the Turks are aiding the rebels. There's no doubt about it. The rebels are terrorists. The Hula massacre, it turns out Frank Furner Anamari Zaitung has blamed the rebels, not the Assad regime. Now, in other words, terrorists come, come in all shapes and sizes and they're not necessarily just Muslim guys with beards.